Good evening, and thank you very much for being here for the 24th event of this One Ocean Summit, which started a long time ago. And uh, the first event of its kind really set, or the uh, this music that we heard on the first day really set the tone for this event. And I think we've had about 800 speakers so far. About 180,000 people have um, been listening in via this online communication. And uh, that's been since the 9th of February, and it doesn't end here because, as you know, we have the 11th of February, which is the last day. These three days form the marathon of this event. Then there's the high-level event tomorrow with the President of the Republic, as well as a number of guests, heads of state and government, as well as a number of surprises. For those of you who might not be in the room, then um, it, do please spend a few hours learning about subjects uh, that are very much global. And there are subjects that I believe that we've dealt with here, the, with the Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs, who we are pl pleased to welcome here, to Brittany, to Brest. This is a subject which affects our country directly because of its maritime position and also because of, of where it is in the European Union. I believe that this is the first. This is a first for a member state's presidency to have an event such as this, and to have gathered the international maritime community for these three days. We're extremely grateful for this because this dialogue that takes place among different nationalities. We have 53 different nationalities, 40 countries as well, which have sent in messages and have come together to form this coalition to set ambitions for the group, the breast commitments, which will be made tomorrow in front of the, uh, in the public at large. And this will be, I imagine that it will be very much under scrutiny. So that's a big moment for France, especially because of it, uh, because it's a big moment for Europe. And so we're wrapping up today's sessions with this workshop dealing with Europe and the sea. And without further ado, I will give you the floor. And uh, thank you very much to Mr. Le Drian for being with us today. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to greet the Commissioner, if I may, the European Commissioner for the Environment. I believe that we're going to be hearing from the Commissioner uh, uh, from uh, a distance. Sorry that you weren't able to be with us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, feel that I'm uh, playing at home here. But it's always a great pleasure. So to, I'd like to open this meeting by sharing with you a long-held conviction, which the years have only served to strengthen. Nothing that happens on the surface or in the depth of the seas and oceans can be foreign to us today. And not because just because we're here in Brest, but we do see it here. But in reality, I believe that it is true everywhere and for all of us, even if we're not always aware of it. First of all, it's true in the daily life of everyone and in a very specific way, if only because maritime, maritime transport represents over 80% of international trade. So there is a good chance that at this very moment that I'm speaking to you, you're either wearing some clothing or carrying a phone that has arrived by sea. And if only because the internet uh, depends uh, to 99 percent on underwater cables. And those of you who are following our online discussions from another continent are connected to us by the sea. And it's just as true that when it comes to our future, given the very present strategic threats and the environmental risks that are now accumulating in the seas and in the oceans to the point of making them both a new contested space where we must give ourselves the means to retain freedom of action and an endangered common good. A contested space and it's clear that um, from now on 
maritime spaces are uh, being the th are serving as the theater of a strategic toughening up, where we see an increase in attempts at fait accompli, as well as uh, intimidation, piracy, trafficking, and illegal fishing, fishing, which still constitutes serious threats. But it's also a common good in danger. We've heard a number of reminders of this, that the seas and oceans produce more than the more than half of the oxygen we breathe. They are the lungs of our planet, more so even than our tropical forests. And that is why the question of the Europe of the sea, which brings us here together today, is, in my opinion, a, deci a decisive issue for all Europeans, and not only for the people of Brittany or not for the people who live around the Baltic Sea or the people who live around the Mediterranean. This question of the Europe of the Sea refers to one of the fundamentals of the European project. I was speaking with Pascal Lamy, who is here somewhere, last century. And um, we were talking about our memories. It seems as if it were a different life, um, but uh, especially because I was uh, dealing with the sea issues under um, a previous government. So I have these mem memories, but I believe that um, my colleague can speak better about this than me. But when we were negotiating uh, the tax, uh, total allowable catches and quotas right before Christmas, and I still I think this happens today. You're alone, working to the 11th hour, and um, nothing untoward going on, obviously. But I do have these memories. They were back in the, in the 80s, 90s. It was right after Spain and Portugal has, had acceded to the European Union. And the common fisheries policy was one of the very fundamentals of Europe's project. So Europe of the sea is also founded on maritime solidarity. And it's very important to remind ourselves of this as at a time when we're having these discussions in this forum about the Europe of the sea, that there are strong precedents. And we see that these maritime challenges are still very much at the top of the agenda, including the subject of fisheries. And um, there's the question of Brexit, which I won't delve into here, but we know that the topic of fisheries, maritime issues, are far from being secondary in nature. But now the question of uh, oceans and seas are very much at the center of uh, European geopolitics of the 21st century, which the 27 of us must invent by making strategic use of the assets we have in order to defend our interests, and assert our model of law and progress in the world on the brink of brutalization, a, a world of power games, power struggles, which has been uh, accelerating over a number of years now. Europe is the world's leading maritime power in terms of the size of its maritime zone. And that gives us a special responsibility, but it also gives us considerable levers to weigh in on the international maritime scene and therefore to set the course for globalization. And that's exactly what we're doing from the Mediterranean, that this historic crossroads of civilization to which our Europe owes so much to the Indo-Pacific, we're a decisive part of the history of the 21st century will be written. And that is why one of the many priorities of the French presidency of the Council of the European Union have been set, and the president has insisted upon this. The maritime dimension is very, very present. We know that an increasing share of international stability is played out on the seas and oceans. Even though, alongside that, we're experiencing an erosion of maritime multilateralism. That is why we want to do more with our African Union partners. We will be speaking about this at the EU Africa Summit next week to tackle piracy, mainly in the Gulf of Guinea. And we also want to make progress 
maritime coordonnée on the EU's coordinated maritime presence in the Indo-Pacific. There will be a forum taking place in Paris on the 22nd of February dealing with this very subject to defend it with our partners in the region of the Indo-Pacific. There will be a, a, a symposium defending international maritime law, starting with the fundamental pre freedom, uh, principle rather, of freedom of navigation. We also know that asserting our European sovereignty and defending our commercial interests is also at stake in the fight against distorting practices which distort the game for the European maritime sector. We have many cards to play. It is a strategic sector which we must come together to support. It's a lever, as I mentioned. And of course, we have the ecological struggle, which must involve the seas and the oceans. Therefore, we have to act. We'll be talking about specific commitments tomorrow, but the action plan for the Mediterranean in 2030 is one example. Uh, the UCM forum that took place in Marseille a short while ago shows that there is real mobilization around these commitments. And we have to come together under the aegis of the United Nations to bring to a successful conclusion the BBNJ Treaty on the Protection of bio, Marine Biodiversity in the High Seas. This is something that Europeans will have to do together during this presidency. And I think that's one of the, subject, the subjects that we will be dealing with during this meeting. I'd also like to say that I remember the words that were said during a recent sea cluster forum about the 21st century, saying that it is already and will increasingly be a maritime century. That is plain for us all to see, and that is why, why we need to set our European course, dear friends. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Minister. Without any further ado, I propose that we now move to the European Commissioner for Environment, Oceans and Fisheries, who should be up on the screen soon. Virginius Sinkevicius. Thank you very much. Minister uh, Ledra. Ministers, uh, members of parliament, dear friends, I would like to thank the French presidency for the invitation extended to us and indeed it's uh, Mm, of course, a summit where we're able to, where we're speaking about something that is of the utmost importance, that is to say, the future of our oceans. A summit not just to emphasize the plight uh, of the ocean and seas, which we all know uh, very well, but also to decide how we can uh, tackle those challenges. Speaking of a Europe, of the sea, I will touch upon three aspects. Number one, having the largest maritime space comes with the moral and practical duty to protect the ocean within its own borders and beyond. Number two, as a top five producer of wild and farmed seafood ranked before the USA and Russia, Europe has the responsibility to use marine resources wisely and of course sustainably. Number three, as the third largest economy in the world, we have the opportunity to develop sustainable solutions at scale and influence the technological uh, development, production methods and consumption patterns across the world to the benefit of our ocean and our planet at large. And let me address each of these three aspects with some examples. First, Europe that protects the oceans. This is at the core of the EU's international ocean governance agenda. 
pursuing a cross-cutting and integrated approach built on strong partnership, multilateral dialogue and international cooperation is the way forward. We all have a collective and individual responsibility to protect the ocean. Today, I would like to highlight two elements in that regard. First, the ongoing negotiations on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, beyond the undisputed importance of the agreement in itself. I do believe that its successful conclusion could have a positive spillover effect on other major international negotiations, such as those on the Convention on Biological Diversity. Second, the importance to safeguard the fragile ecosystems of the poles. The EU has been campaigning since many years to establish much needed marine protected areas in Antarctica, for example. We can't give up on this, uh, uh, even though we continue to be faced with staunch opposition from China and Russia. The second role for a Europe of the sea refers to Europe that uses the marine resources sustainably. And I want to highlight our strong commitment to sustainable fisheries. See, in the EU, we have the commitment, even the legal obligation to manage our fisheries so that all fish stocks are healthy and productive. Member states are increasingly uh, understanding and accept this approach, as despite certain short-term reductions of fishing opportunities in the long run, we only stand to gain. We now have to increase our efforts in more complex and sensitive areas, in particular the Mediterranean, and we must do a better job at reconciling fisheries with biodiversity and ecosystem protection, and we will soon present an action plan to, to that end. Outside our borders, we must continue to drive improvements in the regional fisheries management organizations and support the development of robust scientific advice in those organizations. Moving on to the third role for a Euro Europe of the sea, a sustainable blue economy and ocean knowledge. Last year, we presented a new strategic vision for our blue economy policy, aligning in it with the European Green Deal objectives of decarbonization, circular economy, zero pollution and nature restoration. There is enormous potential for the sustainable blue economy to help achieve those objectives, whether it is through offshore renewables, blue biotech, aquaculture, responsible tourism, you name it. The blue economy can transform our mainstream economy. But at the same time, we also saw the urgency to, of, doing, uh, of, of doing away with some of the existing practice, business models and production methods. Take the example of maritime transport. Nowadays, shipping relays almost entirely on highly polluting fossil fuels. Going for zero will mean we have to develop an entirely new fuel ecosystem in which renewable and low carbon fuels are being produced, distributed and used by maritime operators. Similarly, drastic changes are needed in other sectors of the blue economy. This giant leap, this transformation can only be successful if we massively invest in research and innovation and in ocean knowledge. In other workshops, we have already explained our mission ocean research project, whose core objective is to scale up solutions to restore the health of our marine and aquatic ecosystem. And we also uh, have mentioned how we are moving from our existing data infrastructures and ocean services to a European digital twin ocean. The, di the digital twin is a simulated environment in which all ocean players can perform impact assessments, explore different scenarios and much more. The uses are really unlimited. So this is my take on a Europe of the sea. Let's use occasions at this one, uh, not just to showcase what we have done, but also to raise the ambition, our own ambition and that of our international partners. Parce que la protection de les océans et des mers dépendra... So the protection of the oceans and the seas will depend on how we work together, but not only that, it will also depend on our ability to inspire others. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Excellencies, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Europe. When we were preparing this 
session. Well, I can say that it's difficult to use the word island and moderation in the same uh, in the same sentence, but I'm going to try my best. This evening, well, we've two tasks. One is to act on how we save the ocean and send a message in a very small bottle to very important people tomorrow. And the second is to finish before the decade of ocean science is over. Okay, so I don't know which will be the more difficult, but I suspect uh, the messages will not be difficult. My name is John Bell, uh, and I'm responsible for uh, research innovation uh, in the oceans and climate at the European Commission. And for my Celtic cousins, uh, uh, good evening, uh, Goler. So we are at a very important turning point, as the minister has said, for Europe, for the planet, for the peoples around us. The European Union has launched the European Green Deal, and in essence, it's the latest peace process of the European Union. Our task is to make peace with nature. That's the next great task of the European Union. And the European Union is many unions. It's an, a banking union, an energy union, a finance unit, union. Will it, in response to what the minister has been saying at this century of the ocean, become an ocean union one day? And that's part of our discussion uh, this evening, is in this decade of decision for our planet to turn it into a decade of discovery and finally a decade of demonstration. So our question is, what is it that Europe can do to best address the needs of the ocean through its Green Deal? And I begin by introducing somebody who needs absolutely no introduction, uh, Geneviève Pons. I don't know if the phrase eminence bleu works, <laughs> but uh, Geneviève has been an inspirational force with us in guiding our great mission. I think it's called Starfish in France? Yes. Uh, the mission Starfish <laughs> in France. Uh, to, en France, il faut comme les, les Romains en Rome. Hein? Uh, so, uh, Geneviève needs no introduction as somebody who's been an inspiration for us, Director General and Vice President of the Europe Jacques Delors Institute. And we remember Jacques Delors this evening as one of the great champions in being bold about the future when we think about the challenges ahead. She's obviously been the leader of the World Wildlife uh, Fund office in Europe uh, and has been a member of our mission assembly, more than a member. So I just give the floor to you, uh, Geneviève, who's our co-chair this evening, Geneviève Pons. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, I'm extremely happy to, to be here. And uh, I would like to start uh, with a few uh, French words. Uh, Monsieur le Ministre. Minister, I'm very happy to see you today. I see you from time to time, but we actually met for the first time back in 1992 during the, um, the, an event in, in line with Jacques Delors, in fact. As you all know already too well, our ocean is under multiple threats from climate change, biodiversity loss, overfishing, pollutions of all sorts. We must act all together and urgently. The EU, that has the largest marine territory in the world and, and uh, an important and flourishing blue economy, has a special duty to act. But to be able to influence at global level, the EU has to lead by example. This is what the mission Restore Our Ocean and Waters by 2030 better known in France as the Starfish mission, will allow the EU to do, if it sticks to its recommendations, organize in five branches. I'm happy that you have, you have these five branches under your eyes. We need a strong and streamlined governance. We need enhanced science and knowledge. We need to fight drastically pollutions of all sorts. We need to augment the protection of our marine and aquatic 
ecosystem that we also name in the starfish mission our hydrosphere. As everything, as you know, is totally interlinked. You certainly know that 80% of the pollutions, the marine pollutions, come from uh, the, uh, the land. So we need to protect and we need to have a sustainable blue economy. But as this summit is a place for actions, I will insist on five of them that I find emblematic and that can be achieved rapidly. First, as far as science is concerned, build a digital twin of the ocean. Pascal Lamy will tell more of that to you a bit later in this workshop. And this is linked to the global digital twin of the ocean, uh, which is part of the ocean decade. So that's the first point. Second, we need knowledge and skills. And for that, what we advise in our starfish uh, mission is to put in place a blue Erasmus, both for students and for apprentices, to form them to the new jobs of the sea. Third, we need to enable citizens to act. And for that, we propose to create a European blue regeneration voluntary corps. A solidarity corps already exists at European level. And when you ask to citizens what they want to do, they want to act. So we have to enable them to act. Fourth, fight plastic pollution in Mediterranean through the setting of our first lighthouse project. Five, enhance and streamline governance in EU institutions. To this effect, the institute that I am leading, Europe Jacques Delors, has put forward 13 recommendations. So you can go to the next slide that will give you maybe an idea or at least the title of this report uh, for a better uh, governance at EU level, uh, be it in the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the Council. If these actions become effective, then we will be better placed to lead by example. There is a lot to be done at international level, and 2022 can be the great year of the ocean. But for that, here again, starfish obliges. I will insist on five actions. First, secure an ambitious uh, BBNG agreement to protect our high seas. Second, launch the negotiations of a global plastic treaty in two weeks in Nairobi. Third, secure an agreement at COP15 on the CBD on the protection of 30% of our ocean by 2030. Fourth, do not give up on obtaining the protection of 4 million square kilometers of marine areas in Antarctica and continue to insist on Russia and China to secure at last what can be seen as the most important act of environment protection in history. Do not give up, as Mr. Sinkevichus has said, and I wish to take this occasion to warmly thank him for his engagement at the service of this cause. Fifth, facilitate and reinforce global governance through enhanced science, namely a global digital twin of the ocean, I have speak, spoken of it uh, already, and an IPOC. What is an IPOC? It's an international panel on ocean uh, conservation at the image of the IPCC. To all of these actions must be added a constant fight of overfishing and IUU. If we deliver on all of this, we will be able to lead by example 
and to ma make our blue planet better. Thank you. Thank you, Geneviève. Becomes a starfish diplomat. The five actions we begin. This is the spirit of our session. It's about actions uh, uh, for change. We now move into the uh, how Europe can be an example. The Green Deal, the Pact Vert, uh, which is this fundamental change in all of the systems underpinning the European Union, has a blind spot for the ocean. Um, we, we are moving now with Commissioner Sinkovicius and Commissioner Gabriel to move the ocean back to the center of the Green Deal. So here, when we're looking at all of these targets and goals for biodiversity, for food chains, for water, for climate adaptation, for climate mitiga mitigation, um, how do we place uh, our oceans, our seas and our waters at the center of the European Green Deal goal? And this is, of course, central to the uh, motivation of the mission Restore Our Oceans and Waters, which is a kind of like the moonshot mission in the 1960s. This is an attempt to do something dramatic. It's actually trying to put ourselves on a different version of our Earth, changing our systems in the oceans to how they should be by 2030 in three particular ways, by restoring in our aquatic ecosystems at scale, and that is the word hydrosphere, the author of whom I think is sitting in the room here this evening, to think in a different way of the whole water system as being connected, re re preventing and eliminating pollution and decarbonizing the blue economy. So in a question to the panel, it's the difficult question of how. I think we have lots of people here who know what. So how can Europe best restore the health of the ocean so that the ocean can help us uh, achieve our Green Deal future together? And we begin with a very distinguished and active panel, um, Antidia Sitores who I think many of you know is the uh, spokesperson for Surfrider Foundation Europe um, and has been working actively on the Beyond Plastic Med Coalition and is an active member and a friend of ours from the Mission Board. Um, and here, again, just use the word stakeholders, Antidia. How do we get stakeholders mobilised, the citizens who are out there whose future we're talking about? Um, well... It's just easy to answer. If you want to involve people, you have to listen to them. So we did it a few years ago with the Voice for the Ocean campaign. It was a consultation asking people, what do you want on the political agenda when we mean oceans? And the answer was quite easy also to hear. We want to stop microplastic. We want shipping to be green. We want climate change to be addressed. And this is very useful for us to bring this on the table, uh, to bring this in the Starfish mission, also in English, and to facilitate this progress uh, every day and for the, for the next generation. And nowadays, we want to evolve all the generation here. We want to evolve an um, implementation of uh, this objective we build together with uh, this starfish mission, having really good objective for a Nancy ocean, having uh, less plastic pollution in Mediterranean area, having uh, blue ships or green ships, if you could say like that, and facilitating also all the stakeholders' uh, involvement. And in the way that Surfrida wanted to contribute to that part on this year, of the youth, because we are in this year of the youth and on this French presidency, we create a network of young ambassadors that are here in the room and that will address uh, many questions after. So, so just say hello. And they will be the one who will be implementing with us, of course. This is not creating a gap between the generation. This is creating a bridge to facilitate this involvement. So how we do it is working together, having a dialogue with industry, having a dialogue with NGOs, facilitating this dialogue around. And I think that this One Ocean Summit is a signal of the first dialogue dedicated to the ocean at international level. So this first step 
but it's just a, just a beginning. We have many treaties to come, many treaties to work on, like you said already, uh, Geneviève, on plastic, on BVNG, and other one. And of course, Europe is here to have a leadership. And you already mentioned, and just to conclude on this point, I think that also we have to train the next generation to facilitate trainees, and you mentioned Erasmus, Blue, or facilitating new trainees dedicated to ocean and not just to shipping or having tourism in mind, having other activities. And John, allow me to, to think about another Mr. Bell that was our vice president and that have fined for years to talk about Erasmus Blue. He left us, but his idea is here. And we are happy that you address this thing. So. Merci, Antidia. And it is important that we remember people who make our societies and our futures better. So thank you for mentioning him. Um, now, I know we also, in listening, should also maybe learn from the next generation who have to deal with what we leave them. So we will make sure there's time for you to come in. Uh, and Tudia has uh, brought some great people with her. The next person to speak is Laurent Kerleguer. He's the chief executive officer of the French National Hydrographic Service, CHUM. Um, and you've an outstanding career with the Atlantic Hydro Hydrographic Mission, I understand. Uh, and, uh, and are on the board of border in, in, in times past. So you've chaired the contact group between the International Hydrographic Organization and the European Union. So for that alone, you should be thanked. And I give the floor to you, Laurent. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah, so just to, uh, to mention that uh, actually we don't know the ocean. Uh, I think uh, the, this idea at least is progressing, if not the knowledge itself. Uh, so um, there is more gaps, more gaps than knowledge, actually, um, so to say. Uh, we estimate today that 20% uh, of the sea bottom uh, topography has, is known. And um, this is only with a coarse, uh, a coarse knowledge, whereas um, there are some requirements nowadays for um, high resolution uh, knowledge of the ocean. So you see 20% coarse uh, knowledge, and we would need 100% uh, and uh, maybe uh, higher resolution uh, knowledge. Hopefully, we, we have this, uh, this program, the uh, CBET 2030 uh, program, which has for uh, objective uh, to uh, uh, have a full coverage of the uh, ocean uh, topography uh, by 2030, so 100% by 2030. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Europe is uh, very active in this program. Uh, it has um, uh, really efficient and uh, uh, exemplary role for organizing and uh, supporting uh, data acquisition uh, or maybe more data sharing uh, of its members. There are quite a few uh, European programs uh, like uh, Copernicus for uh, Earth uh, Observation, uh, EMONTNET and its nine portal to support uh, marine policies, uh, we have CISE, then the uh, Common uh, Information Sharing Exchange for uh, supporting of um, uh, maritime operations. And uh, like uh, Commissioner uh, Sinkevicius mentioned, uh, also we have now the Digital Twin Ocean uh, to have a digi full digitali digitization of the ocean. So uh, these programs uh, are very emblematic of the uh, um, involvement of Europe in ocean, uh, ocean affairs. And I think it, it's fair to say that um, uh, Europe is a key player uh, for ocean sciences. And this relies on its uh, members, which have um, a very good organization to produce data. And let me uh, uh, mention uh, among these uh, members, uh, Ireland, which has a very nice program, uh, Informar, to, to, to map the ocean, and uh, also CMAP uh, from Portugal. So these are really two uh, really nice uh, initiatives to um, uh, 
uh, to map the ocean. Uh, I would like also to stress the, the importance of uh, hydrographic offices in Europe, which have a culture of data uh, inherited from their uh, responsibility for uh, uh, producing charts that ensure the uh, safety of navigation. And uh, uh, hydrographic offices of Europe have, um, uh, have gathered to uh, and, and, um, closely cooperate uh, since m almost 10 years now with DG Mare uh, from Europe, D Directorate uh, Gener General for um, um, Maritime Affairs. And uh, there was 10 years ago, we had this memorandum of understanding between the IHO, the International Hydrographic Office, and the, uh, and the Europe, uh, European Union, uh, which was signed to, uh, uh, to engage this close cooperation. And I take the opportunity to salute uh, uh, Matthias Jonas, the uh, IHO uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary General. So uh, Europe is doing well, but uh, we have to broaden the scope now. Uh, we have to broaden the scope because um, there are many, uh, many activities like, uh, or many uh, risks or many uh, stakes like climate change, um, uh, marine energy, uh, natural risk mitigation uh, that require uh, uh, um, a more holistic approach, a more holistic uh, knowledge of the ocean. So we uh, definitely uh, need to have a multi-parametric uh, approach uh, of, uh, in our um, uh, observation uh, of the ocean. Uh, so w w this is really something that has to be um, at, the heart, uh, at, the, at the heart of the target for, uh, for, for of what Europe should do now. So very modestly, uh, if I had to make some uh, recommendations for Europe, uh, first would be to, to keep doing what it's doing already very well, which is gathering existing data from um, uh, big organizations. Uh, we do it through uh, ModNet, and uh, so we have really to, to keep doing this. Second would be to be maybe more active in gather gathering data from those projects that Europe is financing that have um, uh, some data acquisition and that we definitely need to capitalize. And to uh, capitalize good quality data, we have also in those projects, Europe also has into this project to, to set standards that will make sure that these data are good quality. And then, and maybe most important, because uh, up to now I told you only about existing data, uh, what Europe should do more now maybe to would be to support uh, new uh, data acquisition. Otherwise, uh, this idea of seabed uh, 2030 having 100% uh, sea bottom topography depiction by 2030 won't be achieved. And uh, well, I think it's never, and we have this data act, and that's probably a good opportunity to, to do that. And I think it's never too early to begin uh, let me give you um, uh, an example. 300 years ago, here in Brest, across this river, uh, Pinfeld, uh, some people began to measure the water level. And still now, uh, we have a, a tide gauge, so we have 300 years uh, measurements. And I'm pretty sure that those guys, 300, year, 300 years ago, uh, didn't imagine or wouldn't have expected that those measurements they started to, to make would, be, uh, would testify the climate change. So never too early to begin. Thank you. Merci bien, Laurent. And uh, it, I mean, we know that civilization and progress begins with mapping and where we are if we want to know where we want to go to. And I think in, in referring to the Irish map, uh, Ireland discovered its highest mountain uh, in the course of that mapping exercise and realized it was actually under the water. Um, so who we are is transformed by knowledge. Um, now to give a very distinguished uh, uh, colleague of ours, uh, Professor Maria Cristina Pediccio is a professor of algebra at the University of Trieste, but you've dealt with more complicated issues in dealing with citizens who are a little bit more difficult to decipher. So over to you, Cristina. Yes, so thank you very much. I've been part of the 
mission board, it has been a very exciting experience, and I must say that I learned a lot. One lesson that I learned is the importance, absolute importance, of involving people, citizens. They must be part of our, somebody was saying this morning, revolution. But all people, also the taxi driver, all people, <laughs> that's what they were saying from the commission, all people, not only educated people or people that live next to a certain cultural uh, entourage. So how to do? We did a lot of um, surveys, as Antidia was already saying, in different countries, so one very interesting in France, in Italy, in northern countries, to understand what citizens want. Also, depending on the different conditions, that means, do you live near the sea? Do you live far away of the sea and uh, you don't think at sea except for vacation? Which is your social level, your education level, your age? From these surveys, uh, we find out, I just summarized two main points. First, people, most of the people want to be involved. They are glad to be involved. They are glad to be part of the implementation uh, progress. Second point, we should try to build actions, concrete actions that are, uh, we could say, tailor-made, depending on the target we want to refer to. We cannot communicate to all in the same way. Examples, I'll bring two concrete examples from Italian experience. We discuss a lot with the other members about involving kids, small kids from two years, three years. And uh, we tried in Italy, we hope it will be successful. So now Starfish uh, has become a character. Her name is Martina, the Starfish, and it has been <laughs> created by a very popular artist, Italian artist that is doing booklets uh, for education for kids, the ages from two to six. And so Martina is uh, below water and is fighting against uh, plastic litter with a small net and with, uh, so it's an adventure. And we hope this will be effective because we intend uh, to give this booklet to all uh, nurseries, small schools. So this is one example, that kind of age. We also are thinking many things for elderly people uh, relating uh, sea education with literature, with classical novels and so on. But I want to mention another concrete example. If you were in the previous panel, you have seen the powerful of art to communicate and to emotion people, again, this word emotion. And one experience that we did uh, last year was a celebration of Dante. So an exhibition has been created, artistic exhibition, from hell to paradise, a trip into the Plastico Cena. So this is, and is still performing in Italy in different location, an uh, installation with three rooms, three kind of rooms that represents hell, purgatory, paradise. There are also explanations uh, from scientists related to Dante verses and so on, but the immersive experiences, experience is very emotional. In hell, it's all black, there is no life. And this is where we will uh, fall if we don't do anything. Purgatory is today. Ha and paradise is where we can go if everybody will contribute and if everybody will be responsible. So these are examples of tailored made initiatives. But I would like to mention another aspect that we discuss a lot in the board and is the Mediterranean. Today we have heard a lot again, our minister and uh, others, and uh, the, it has been mentioned the Lighthouse Initiative for the Mediterranean, you mentioned, Genevieve mentioned before, but I would like to point out another aspect, education. If we want to improve uh, the world, we must improve individuals, Marie Curie was always saying. To improve individuals, we cannot do country by country, member state by member state. We must build some share and uh, co-organized programs. Not easy in the Mediterranean. You can imagine different culture, religious, political problems and so on. But we tried 
jointly. And I, again, I want to mention two examples, the Blue Med initiatives, 16 countries have been involved with many action for young people, hackathon training uh, seminars on, and the pilot, pi pilot project on plastic uh, involving all Mediterranean countries. This is one concrete example. Thanks to the Commission for the support. Another example, the last one, is a Blue Skills Experience. Blue Skills is a graduate program that is supported, financially supported by Italian uh, ministry. You have met our minister this morning. And they are financially supporting. So kids, students can be paid for participating physically to this uh, master program. And uh, is a program that is called Sustainable and Responsible Blue Economy. It's multidisciplinary and uh, the participants are male and female from different countries. Female from the south side of the Mediterranean are exceptional. They are so motivated and now many of them are traveling around, they got new jobs and so on. This is an experience that uh, I think could be scaled up at European level because clearly now the number are small, but there is a network of uh, ambassador and new year a new network and so on. Could be scaled up and to conclude, last comment, uh, this is a concrete example of the power of science diplomacy. It's important for science, it's important for society, for sustainability, but it's important for a geopolitical, more friendly and peaceful dialogue in this uh, incredible area that is our Mediterranean. Thank you very much. Grazie mille, uh, Mary Cristina. And uh, again, if there is one thing that is geopolitical about the European Union, it is our maritime uh, power. We look to the Mediterranean, our Mare Nostrum. Um, ocean work is what unites and brings people together, unlike other areas. So this is a very powerful message. Um, and maybe on Dante, you can tell us where we ended up at the end of the evening. <laughs> but we are, I think, the opening line of Dante, nel, nel, nel mezzo del cammino di nostri oceani. <laughs> We're in the middle of the pathway in terms of where we go with our oceans, okay. So now we move, um, I learned a new word uh, today in en Francais, c'est uh, maritimiser, il faut maritimiser. Et maintenant il faut maritimiser. And so now we have to try and maritimize a new word I heard in French, uh, our democracies. Uh, the first, Gazina Meisner, I'm not sure if Gazina, who has been unable to travel is ready to uh, join us. I think she is. Uh, Gazina was. Uh, 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 there you go, Gazina. Good evening. Good evening, Gazina. Wie geht's? <laughs> Alles good? <laughs> nice, good. Nice to see you. So I think Gazina needs no introduction. It's safe to say that Gazina is uh, a woman parliamentarian who transformed the way the parliament took the oceans and the world of the oceans seriously and has spent a great deal of time on the mission board working out how to educate and communicate. So over to you, uh, Gazina. Yeah, thank you so much, John. I really regret that I cannot be with you in person, but due to a corona quarantine case, I, I'm here with you on this way. And it's a pleasure for me really to do a call for action together with my ocean twin, Catherine Chabot, who will speak after me. So my call for action is dedicated for the society. So that means for all of us, what can we do? We cannot underline often enough the importance of the oceans and seas for our daily living and for the future of mankind. We all like to spend our holidays at the seaside, to swim, to dive, go by boat, but most people don't know about the oceans, their value and their threats. Simply said, oceans are taken for granted. Or as Bismarck once said, people are sitting with the back to the sea and looking to the mountains. This has to be changed. We have to turn the heads and the minds around, so to say. Best would be we could send all our calls for action in the TV news. That would be the most efficient way to teach people. The message is simple but cannot be repeated often enough. We live on a blue planet. Oceans are not simply important for our breath, for food, for trade, for blue energy and resources. Their rich biodiversity is a treasure and great heritage for mankind. We need healthy, healthy oceans and seas 
for fighting climate change. They did already absorb 60% of the heat we produced and 30% of the CO2. And mangroves, kelp forests, seaweeds, and wetlands are more efficient for the Green Deal than trees and forests. Everybody talks about green trees and forests, but not about the ocean side. And up to now, we know more about the moon than about the deep sea. We must change this all together, like the Generation Ocean we just saw in a video at the end of the last workshop. Mission Starfish on EU level and the UN decade, Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, are two parallel programs for the next 10 years, aiming to create a global movement for a good future for our oceans and seas. And this is our chance and our mission. In Germany, we could already build a network of partners from industry, startups, NGOs, art projects, and society groups, like, for example, country women, scouts, political foundations, and Rotary with their project and plastic seed. Regarding education, we cooperate up to now with the STEM initiative, with UNESCO Project Schools for Sustainable Development, and with the House of Little Researchers, that's a nationwide institution for kindergartens and schools and their leaders. So we teach teachers and kindergarten leaders. So let us all join forces start information campaigns on our neighborhood and even in our individual networks. Let us create platforms to connect science stakeholders and all interested people for a vivid exchange of views. For example, it could be named, let's talk about oceans and go for action. The more ocean friends we have, the better for our beloved blue planet. The little prince once said, if you want people to build a boat, Teach them the longing for the sea. Same goes as well for our mission. You protect what you love. So let's go home and make everybody love the sea. Brilliant, Kazina. Vielen Dank. Thank you for turning uh, the ocean into a vernacular language for all generations. And now we come to the lady you've passed the torch on to, Catherine Chabot, who, of course, is a champion of the oceans in the European Parliament. She needs no introduction. She's been, of course, the first woman to sail solo and nonstop around the world and now is attempting something even more uh, challenging, which is to get the European Parliament to se maritimiser uh, institutionnellement. I can give the floor to Catherine Chabot. Yeah. My dear Gazine, j'espère que tu nous entends. I hope that you can hear us. Dear ocean lovers, first of all, that's the word on Gazine Meissner. Because it's her, in fact, John, who really did rise sea levels, let's say, within the European Parliament. She's my uh, ocean twin, let's say. And I'm really happy that you um, have launched this call to action, uh, along with two other um, members of my uh, people here in this room, the European, um, the European MP, who is Finisterian, so from this part of the world, and he focuses on fishing issues. And we also have with us an important figure who really does um, give the maritime dimension of the, um, does bring the maritime dimension to the European Parliament. So we, we are actually addressing this call to all of the different um, elected members, but also members of society in general. The EU is not only the world's largest market, as my colleague Stéphane Bijou, a member of the European Parliament, and uh, from La Réunion stresses the nine outermost regions and the 13 overseas countries and territories contribute to making Europe the world's leading maritime area, which extends to all oceanic regions of the globe. Secondly, all Europeans benefit from the services that the ocean provides to humanity, whether or not their country as a direct link with the sea. It remains a source of wealth and employment for the 27 member states. Yet, 
at the same time, we all participate in the pressures at, that the ocean is undergoing emissions, pollution, and activities as well. We therefore, third, sorry, uh, so, sorry. <laughs> Third, European governance of the sea has recently become more integrated, but this progress does not prevent sea issues from being dealt with in silos outside legislative text. I witness uh, with this in the European Parliament every day. We therefore call for a new European governance of the sea with some key proposals. All our sea overseas territories met be fully involved in the new, this new governance. And this starts with giving visibility to this overseas island and maritime Europe. We must urgently improve the coherence of sea related. Ocean is more than fish and ships. <laughs> as should say my colleague, as should say John Bell, I think, and my colleague Pierre Karleskin. It's also energy, transport, digital, pharmaceutical, genetic and mineral resources, culture, of course, as we heard. Uh, we therefore call at the commission level for an ocean crew and a vice president on ocean issues as a captain. At the parliament level, we call to transform the intergroup Sirica, created by Gesine, in a new committee or to create an ocean committee. And we think about that with Pierre Carleskin. As the French president recalled the 21st century will be maritime, concrete changes must be made, including revisiting the distribution of parliamentary committees and changed for almost 20 years. At the council level, Mr. Minister, we call to put ocean issues as pri priority of the rotative presidency. It's a message for your colleague, <laughs> colleagues. I am taking the opportunity of this call for action to formally invite the commission, here represented by our dear moderator John Bell, to come to the European Parliament and work hand in hand with us, MEPs, member of the European Parliament, as well as with the Council to make our European Union an Ocean Union. The moment is timely. Let's take advantage of this Ocean One Ocean Summit and the French Presidency of the Council to build an ocean policy together. First concrete step of this cooperation will be in June. Let's organize a joint event with the three EU institutions at the UN Lisbon conference. Alongside, alongside governance, we need a better coordination of all the agencies and European institutions. Should it be a European Ocean Agency, a starfish, a starfish platform? Starfish in French. We also need a program with two focal points, much more blue in the Green Deal, Le pacte vert, pas assez vert, pas assez bleu, which isn't green enough or not, perhaps not blue enough. Legislation. We need to consider marine, for example, marine and coastal ecosystems, and not only the terrestrial forest in our climate and biodiversity commitments. Therefore, we call for a blue carbon initiative. I hope tomorrow we will have a blue carbon initiative. In implementation of the starfish mission, restore our ocean and waters, and it's used as a strategic vision on ocean policies, Geneviève and Pascal. Finally, the EU has a role to play at a global level. The negotiation on the ICES, the expected plastic treaty, the Antarctica's marine protected areas, SDG 14, aligned with all the SDGs. The EU should also take the lead on a new vision of the global ocean governance that recognize the ocean as a global common and promotes the creation of an IPCC for the ocean, the IPOC we talked about, uh, Geneviève. 
Nous devons faire souffler le vent du large. We should make the breeze of the coast blow over the whole of the European Commission and European Parliament. Thank you. Merci, Catherine. I will not attempt to circumnavigate the invitation to the Parliament. As a dutiful Commission official, I would be delighted uh, uh, to come with our mission team uh, to work, of course, with our uh, institution as the heart of our democracy in Europe, and we will do that. Um, uh, on ocean governance, there is a major communication coming from our colleagues in DG Mare and Commissioner Sinkovic is quite soon, so we will see uh, how that plays out. And as for how the Commission is organised structurally, that's above my pay grade. So uh, again, there are clear uh, uh, institutional discussions between the Parliament, the Council and the Commission at the time when things are changing. So it's very interesting to hear uh, an idea about pour maritimiser le monde politique, we have our main life support system needs a systemic response from our institutions. And I think this is the point that you've made in a very actionable way. And this is what I like about our session this evening. I'm up to 17 concrete actions so far. So I better have a very big bag to take home to Brussels uh, with me tomorrow. Merci, Catherine. Um, so now we will move uh, to the next uh, uh, point. And in, in, in this is looking at, uh, as the, um, it is a shock for most people who don't work around the oceans to hear what our Minister of Foreign Affairs has said, that Europe is the main largest maritime actor in the world. Um, this defines us. So what are the responsibilities for us uh, as an actor? Um, and to begin with, um, I'd simply like to go straight in uh, to one of the great champions uh, of the blue space, uh, Tiago Pito Cunha, who many of you will know, Chief Executive Director of the Oceano Azul Foundation. Uh, he's advised uh, ministers, the President of Portugal, and was a member of the cabinet of the European Commissioner for Maritime Affairs when things were really framed, actually. Um, there's a great diagram in the Institut Jacques Delors of how the policies have evolved. Uh, even I could understand it, Pascal. It was a great uh, infographic, but it shows the work that you were doing there very clearly. And he was an outstanding uh, colleague and, and, and member of our uh, mission board. So, Tiago, over to you. Thank you very much, John. And um, I would say, Mr. Minister, um, dear colleagues, dear friends, um, um, I'd like to um, probably make a, a number of points uh, on this panel, which cannot be better phrased. Uh, I would start, of course, to congratulate uh, the French government and the French president for organizing this conference. Um, we need to mobilize, and this is mobilization in action, and so this is very important. Um, I, um, I was saying that there are three words here that are very important. The word Europe, the word powerful, and the word responsibilities. And they together play another implicit word, which is ambition. And, uh, and so I would also uh, like to refer to that ambition, which is reflected in the phrasing of being Europe the first maritime space in the world. And of course, this is important because most Europeans do not know that. And I think this is important for the mobilization that is needed so that decision making happens. And here I, um, I say that um, it's easy to look at this by, of course, the geography. Uh, Europe is a very particular uh, geography, uh, one of the largest coastlines in the world and maritime space, as the commissioner have referred. But of course, also the might of the European industry, uh, maritime industries, and of course, uh, the leadership on marine sciences. Um, a second note I think is important is connected with the word Europe, of course. Um, uh, uh, this focus in Europe is very important. Uh, Europe is needed to lead the way for a new ocean action so that we face this ocean crisis and the time to act is, is now. Uh, I would say there is no more future because since I work on ocean policies that I hear that the oceans are very important for our future. But that's not the case anymore. Uh, we, the oceans need us now in the present. We need the ocean, but we, we uh, will not have uh, the oceans for the future if we don't act now. So I would like to point out 
also what Brussels has been doing because there has been action made in Brussels and we've been speaking about it. There has been this incredible discrete work made in Brussels by the mission board to restore our ocean and waters or starfish report. And here, I, of course, I would have to have a word for the chairman of this uh, board, uh, Pascal Lamy, who's here with us and with, uh, which led us uh, brilliantly on this and his team and uh, Genevieve, the members of the board, my colleagues that are here as well, and of course uh, the, the European Commission team and John and uh, Sigi Elisabetta and all others. Uh, thank you very much. What uh, I think this Mission Starfish has accomplished uh, is, uh, is not another EU program of techni techni technocratic nature. Quite to the contrary, it is a lucid, forward-looking, broad, bold, and visionary strategy to change the connection between Europe and ocean and waters. Uh, I, I really uh, recommend vividly everyone to read it. It's not a long document and is, uh, I think, probably one of the most uh, vanguardist documents that exists um, uh, in, 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 uh, out there, not only in Europe, but uh, overall. My third note is, the word, is to emphasize the word responsibilities. And of course, responsibility and leadership goes together. It, they have the same meaning. Um, Europe led the world in the past uh, on exploring the ocean. It should have the ambition to lead the world in its future work to save the ocean from its current crisis. Uh, Europe uh, needs ambition. Ambition needs political will so that um, uh, uh, there is action and that the international community will finally take decisions that it has been, in a way, uh, missing to take. Um, and of course here, I would also have to make a reference to the work done recently by the Jacques Delors Institute on governance because for the oceans to be a priority for Europe, we need a new governance, a new ocean governance in Europe, something that started with integrated maritime policy of the European Union almost 20 years ago, but something that is still a job in progress. Um, my fourth note, and I will finish with my fifth, so uh, don't worry, John, is um, why is this relevant? Why do we need uh, this leadership, this responsibility that Europe leads in a way the international community in taking decisions? And this is a very special year with the UN Ocean Conference at the end of this semester. Well, because uh, a restored LC Ocean is absolutely instrumental for Europe to achieve its overarching goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2050. This is the connection. Have no doubts, the EU will not be able to achieve this goal if the ocean is not played as a card, a key card, to achieve this. Um, final note on responsibility. Um, in concrete terms, how can Europe fulfill its responsibilities? Well, I would say that there is an economic action that is needed and, and diplomatic action at the international level. Economic action because we will not save the ocean if we don't change the economy. We know very much that uh, the reason for the ocean crisis and so many other crises lies on our model of economic development. So this green transition uh, chiefed by uh, the Green Deal uh, for Europeans uh, needs to be as blue as possible. Um, by developing, only by developing a new blue circular sustainable and decarbonized blue economy, we will be able to contribute to decarbonize not the blue economy in itself, but the whole European economy as a whole. This is very important that we understand that the blue economy is not important for maritime activities to make them environmental friendly. It's important because the ocean can be critical on energy, on transportation, on food security, and on and through biotechnology and very innovative means of blue economy, a blue bioeconomy to play a role. Uh, secondly, uh, not only the economy, and here of course you will find this agenda for a blue economy in Mission Starfish as well. So uh, again, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, it would recommend uh, reading it. Uh, I would um, say that we need to act at the international level. And of course having the Minister of Foreign Affairs of France here, Gives, gives me a great inspiration to say that we need, as Europeans, we need to mobilize and we need to focus more the international community in, action, in, in, in working for actions. Um, 
uh, we need to mobilize, and of course uh, we are doing that uh, when France organizes a conference like this, or when Portugal with Kenya is co-hosting the UN Ocean Conference, this is mobilization, so uh, it's important. We need especially to mobilize the international community, the UN Ocean, the, UN, the United Nations member states, because that's where action is missing. But we also need to focus, and to focus in a number of concrete key results that we would like to see as outcomes of this UN Ocean Conference. And here, of course, I think that many have already uh, spoken. There are three which are closing to the finish line, but that uh, yet they might never really get there uh, because they've been taking so long uh, or too long. The, of course, uh, the Treaty for Conservation of the High Seas, the so-called BBNJ. Uh, I hope that uh, a decision is taken on this treaty because if we don't get the international community to decide on BBNJ, we will not be able to agree on anything else which uh, would be uh, uh, to, would be revealing of the lack of decision making. The second thing, of course, is the 30 by 30. So 30% 30 of marine protected areas by 2030, and hopefully we will have Kunming doing the job, but UN Ocean Conference needs us also to uh, push for this, and we need to push for roadmaps with interim targets and deadlines before 2030, because if you arrive at 2029 without that roadmap, it's going to be too late. And finally, the uh, harmful fishery subsidies that the World, the World Trade Organization is going to do today, uh, this year. So these are concrete examples of concrete action that we hope that mobilization and focus can achieve. Thank you very much, John, for uh, everything. Molto obrigado, uh, Tiago. And I think as we've seen from uh, the last Catherine and Tiago, uh, they bring us back to the Père Fondateur de l'Europe, uh, Jean Monnet, who said that when you're faced with a, an insuperable object, you have to change the context. Uh, and this is where we're at. Now, I'm always very relieved as an Irishman to see an admiral uh, alongside, given the size of the Irish Navy, uh, it's always reassuring. And Admiral Hervé Blégeon uh, is a military officer of the French Navy, serving as the Director General of the European Union military staff as well as Director of the EU Military Planning and Conduct Capacity. He served with distinction as a Deputy Commander of NATO Maritime Command and has served as a Commander of several European Union as well as NATO operations. And he's a very, very passionate man of the sea. I give you the floor, Amiral. Thank you very much, uh, John. E excuse my French, I will also address in English um, uh, tonight. So. Uh, I'm not sure you'll be relieved after what uh, I would say um, <laughs> with uh, some different angles. Um, ju just uh, uh, to quote first uh, one of our great also skipper, Eric Tabarly, uh, when he was, <laughs> sorry? <laughs> no, I, I, will, I, will, I will quote Tabarly, he was also a naval officer, <laughs> so, so that make the link. Uh, in, in a bitter way, when, when he was uh, in vacation, he was used to say where well, the sea is what we have in the back because we are looking at the beach. So, no, we have to turn around and to adopt a 360 degrees approach, and I do believe that's what EU is uh, doing. By many aspects, European Union is not only the first maritime space, but also the first maritime power. So the actions of EU in support of the oceans is not only a matter of credibility, it's a matter indeed of responsibility triggered by our strategic interest. As a reminder, the whole EU economic exclusive zone is the first in the world, even though contested in some areas. The oceans are part of what we call the global commons. That means in some ways, they belong generally to nobody, meaning they belong to everybody, to the humanity. Like the other global commands, like cyberspace, outer space, the maritime space is the theater of contestation, competition, hybrid warfare, so sorry, I will use some military vocabulary there, and disinformation along. For several years now, we have been in an era of non-peace, non-peace competition. We are generally below the threshold of conventional war, but always beyond the threshold of actions. 
this raging competition is more and more characterized by challenging the international laws and regulations, establishing policies of the fait accompli, weaponizing dramatic circumstances like climate change, migration, or even pandemia. A new kind of warfare, the law fair, is attempting to challenge the multilateralism which constitutes the solid base of our common values. So what EU is doing and developing further its role in the maritime space. First, develop a strategic vision based on facts and priorities. This is clearly the aim of the strategic compass based on a thorough threat and challenge analysis established end of 2020. A strategic compass that we expect will be adopted by the Council in uh, the end of March will put words on problems, actions to tackle those issues, and timelines to deliver. In some other words, it will set an ambition. The development of an hybrid toolbox to counter this hybrid competition will be one of the showcase of the strategic compass foreseen, so as I say, to be adopted by the Council end of March. Second, combine all the instruments at its disposal in an integrated approach. The integrated approach, you have heard of, of it, is not only a buzz word or slogan, it is along the regulatory approach on values as a strength of the EU. The EU Global Strategy, published in 2016, has established the integrated approach as a guiding principle in all aspects of the EU global action. The EU maritime security strategy, already two years before that, laid the ground works for this integrated approach in the maritime environment. And well-established links to other strategies like the EU integrated maritime policy, the EU blue growth strategy, and know the sustainable blue economy in the Green Deal, to name but a few. Thirdly, to reinforce our multilateralism approach through consolidation of partnerships between the like-minded with always keeping the door open uh, for the others. This is the sense, for instance, of the new EU strategy for the cooperation in the Indo-Pacific which contains a strong maritime dimension. Fourth, and that will be my last example, better organize our own coordination between member states and cooperation with partners in some dedicated maritime areas where strategic interests are at stake. The coordinated maritime presence concept is a good example of new initiatives in that domain. The pilot case has been established in the Gulf of Guinea and has shown its added value, allowing sharing of information and coordination between member states deploying navies as well as supporting coordination with other actors or between coastal states. This is supported also by the delivery of equipments and systems to local navies, especially in the field of law enforcement at sea. And I'm not only talking about fighting piracy. I think the overfishing that we can witness in this area may be a more uh, demanding issue uh, in the future. So those equipments could be, can be delivered now through the new instrument that we have in the EU with the European Peace Facility. The lessons learned of this pilot case, as the minister has mentioned, allow member states to envisage to implement a new maritime area of interest in Indian Ocean, Northwest Indian Ocean, in the months to come. So and that will be my conclusion. There are some examples of a growing ambition to the EU to develop a worldwide uh, uh, role in the maritime domain through an integrated approach for the benefit of all people, not only EU people. This includes, if necessary, to be more assertive to counter the unlawful contests and competitions in the oceans. So I would say loading in progress. Thank you.
how can our oceans not be at the center of our thinking and our institutions in Europe after that uh, presentation if our peace and our security depend on doing it together? Thank you very much. That was a great insight. So now I have a very difficult task, with, which is to uh, introduce somebody um, who is, um, we call him a pair refondateur in Europe. When I was a child at the European Commission, when I started off, uh, Pascal Lamy was already one of the people uh, changing the context. Um, you know about his traditions, his role. He's the president of the Paris Peace Forum. He, is, uh, a, he has many, many mandates. He is coordinating the work of the Jacques Delors Institute in Paris, Berlin, and Brussels, and leads and participates in many, many boards, like our own mission board, which are fundamentally setting a new direction um, for Europe and for neighboring uh, parts of our great blue planet. Um, when the history of the European Union is written, this man's name is going to crop up at the beginning, the middle, and the future as one of our Père Fondateur. And when we finally turn the European Union into an ocean union, it will be in no small part due to Pascal Lamy and his determinedness to change the context. Over to you, Pascal, just in case you have something interesting to say. Thank you, John. Uh, good evening. Uh, like many of you, I've attended many of these sessions, workshops, fora uh, since uh, yesterday morning. And what I noticed tonight uh, was that there was a, a lot of emotion. Emotion when we, when Antidia spoke, emotion when Maria Cristina spoke, emotion when uh, Javier spoke, emotion when John spoke. So it's probably because at the end of the day, we realize that the reason uh, why we have to care about the ocean is something that has to do with emotion. Now, back to serious rational language. Uh, let me, uh, before we conclude, make three very short points on top of what we've already heard uh, this evening about uh, the starfish mission. St a starfish, the picture of which was uh, shown by uh, Geneviève. These uh, three points relate uh, to one of the legs of the animal, the one having to do uh, with knowledge and uh, science. Number one, uh, we need a digital twin of the ocean, and we already heard about that tonight. Uh, number two, uh, the EU has now embarked on building one. And number three, uh, which I think is the message I have in my mind uh, for the segment, high-level segment of tomorrow, scaling up this digital twin will require more solid governance. Now, why do we need a, di a digital twin of the ocean? Uh, because uh, ocean and waters are degrading, because we need to reverse this trend, because we need to do this quickly, because we need, in order to do this quickly, a lot of science, uh, which we don't have. Traditional uh, Nautilus-like exploration and observation machines are great, but they are slow and they are costly. New technologies uh, based on big data, on AI, are now available to help us understand this uh, formidable complexity of uh, interactions between climate, uh, ecosystems, human activities. We now can do this with a simulation and modeling, a sort of virtual Nautilus. That's what we need in order to fill the science gap. Provided, of course, we are able to feed these virtual machines uh, with zillions of new data from space and uh, water observation systems. Second point, 
an EU digital twin of the ocean is not a dream anymore. Building it and devoting the necessary budgetary resources is part of this program uh, adopted by the European Commission for the Starfish Mission, uh, the objective of which is to restore our ocean and waters by 2030. This digital twin will build on uh, existing bricks, such as uh, Copernicus Marine, Ebonnet, uh, Mercator Ocean and the like, by 2025 already, the EU should have a precursor DTO that will also provide uh, for uh, local twins. Scaling up this hub and spoke architecture to the global level is also part of the ambition of the uh, EU uh, digital twin of the ocean. Third and last point, uh, moving forward in this direction is clearly in the hands of scientists, of experts. But we also need to address what I see with my own experience as very serious governance challenges. They have to do, uh, for instance, uh, with the coordination of observation systems in both space and waters. They have to do with the aggregation of uh, data, with the interoperability uh, of the simulation and uh, modeling uh, systems. They have to do with uh, open access to and sharing off results and benefits including with poorer countries. Part of these uh, challenges uh, lie within the European Union. Upgrading uh, the governance of the EU hydrosphere is a must do to get our digital twin uh, done. Europe Jacques Delors, and this has already mentioned, which is this uh, Brussels uh, sister of uh, the Paris and Berlin Institut Jacques Delors, has uh, recently tabled a set of proposals uh, in order to make the EU ocean governance less fluid and more solid. That's part of what we have to do within uh, the uh, Union, but another part of these digital twin governance uh, challenges lies with the international system, which, as we all know, is more gaseous than uh, the European one. This is where our IOC friends at UNESCO, ministers, heads of state and government come in. They have to do their job, including tomorrow, including tomorrow, to provide uh, the necessary political impetus and to take the sometimes tough decisions that have to be taken. So, to conclude, let me uh, summarize uh, the message uh, I believe we uh, in the machine room uh, should send to the bridge uh, for tomorrow. That's what I will bring tomorrow morning, unless you object. We uh, can only do our job uh, for ocean science if you are there, do your governance, your organization job. So please be prepared to do it. We are prepared. Thanks for your attention. So before your, uh, we, we move to the point of the program where we wrap up with our uh, member of European Parliament. Um, Maybe there's somebody in the room who's under the age of 30 uh, who'd like to take the floor or ask a question or stand up and, and see if we're listening, if we're getting it. Uh, Yeti Micro, I have a collection here. I'm not sure if I'm a super spreader if I pass them out. But, Thank you. Thank you.
We, we actually work here in Brest at the, univer the university, and we have two brief questions. Firstly, regarding the um, Starfish mission, once the recommendations have been put in place for the, for the European Union, how are we going to make sure that the member states are actually going to implement these recommendations? And view, in view of the urgent, urgency, can we not envisage sanctions for countries that do not actually accelerate and step up their efforts when it comes to these issues? Would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes, a second question. To come back to the Starfish mission, you just mentioned that this will allow more um, harmonization between European actions. Do you not believe that there could be a one sole agency that could bring together all of those different types of um, the skills and activities that are done by several different agencies at the moment, for example, Frontex and others? So could there not be one agency to encompass all of the different agencies that exist today? Well, regarding the second question, the answer can be found on one part in the with the with the with the proposals that have been made by the starfish mission and on the other hand when it comes to the european governance of the oceans that we've already spoken about this after, this evening so the answer is yes we have proposed the creation of a european agency so that we can implement the whole of the starfish mission between now and 2030, and this is also a proposal that has been put forward by Europe Jacques Delors. However, this is not the proposal that the Commission has actually retained. There are reasons for this. I will not go into um, details, and uh, John Bell and uh, other people in this room are friends of mine, so I'm not going to, let's say, um, embarrass them in public by going into details. However, certain services and certain di directorate generals that, are, uh, that, that focus on these issues are not keen on the idea of, let's say, losing some of their um, mandate or having a reduced mandate that will go into the hands of this new agency. And there are, of course, a lot of things that still need to be coordinated. So I believe it's a good idea, but I also understand I've worked for 15 years in, in the, with the Jacques Delors uh, institution, and also I've worked at, uh, in Brussels. And I know that the European Commission isn't necessarily very keen on this proposal. And it will be up to people like you to explain that this isn't just an idea that has been thought up by a few ex experts, they can work more efficiently, but there are real stakes behind all of this. And I hope that this will really be the object of a public debate one day. On the next, on the first question rather, the European, um, the, the Starfish program is a European program. It's, that hasn't come from the European Commission. It's a European program that has been signed up to by member states and the European Commission. The European Commission has to implement this program. It's going to do so using a panoply of different instruments that it has at its disposal, beginning with the um, community budget. Now, I'm not going into details, let's say, regarding the the the, the the exact figures, but what we can say is that the um, Starfish mission between now and 2030 will have around 1 billion euros to work with. That's a lot of money. And this, these funds are a way of um, guiding the actions of member states, including when it comes to research and in the implementation of the different programs. There are also regulatory measures as well. And the spirit in which we have carried out this work, which began at the end of last year when the Commission approved this program, is one of cooperation. 
in the spirit of cooperation. And so the Commission uses what's in its power in terms of convincing, persuading uh, member states to implement this project, which is what we, want, we call one of our flagship projects. It's going to cover the Atlantic, the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, and of course the Mediterranean. Oh, I do not believe at this moment that we need to speak about a kind of top-down uh, sanctions approach. I believe it's something that's more cooperative. And when we know what the community budget is, I have no doubts that if the Commission wants to, it has in its power ways to make sure that this program is fully implemented. And there are many of us who are going to make sure that that happens as much as possible. So before giving the floor to some of Antidia's outriders, maybe uh, Catherine, would you like to come in from the Parliament's point of view? And just from the Parliament, I think it is also part of our responsibility as MEPs to be involved in implementing the Starfish mission. I think that each of us in our respective countries need to be championing this initiative. And this is something that we hear from those involved in Starfish. And I would just like to say that I am happy to take on that job within French within France with the colleagues here. Thank you. And as the person from the Commission in the firing line of the podium here, just to say uh, two things. Um, you will never see a lack of institutional uh, ambition or imagination, I think, from the European institutions. But as uh, Pascal reminded us, there's not just emotion, there is rational uh, debate. And we Commission officials are trained Cartesians, I think you could say, Pascal, um, you saw in the response to COVID a complete transformation in the institutional and legal architecture of how the institutions responded uh, because form follows function. And if the case can be well prepared and made, uh, whatever is needed, whatever kind of knowledge is needed or outreach to citizens or support, the institutions will evolve and will respond. Um, so I think people are, uh, what we're doing in the mission uh, is to create a space, and this goes back to your first question about member states and their responsibilities and ownership. Sustainability is no longer for Christmas, it's for life, to use a, a kind of a phrase. Um, it's not an option anymore. Uh, and all of our member states and our regions and cities are all facing the same challenges. And they're facing an array of new obligations to make this journey to systemic change. So what the mission is to do is to create a space in which the mission offers to member states the opportunity to own the transformation and to be supported in doing that. And part of that will be with the support of the European Parliament and the institutions is to engage with our colleagues with the existing networks of cooperation, which is really what Europe is about, and to build on those in terms of making the means to test, to demonstrate, to convene, and to imagine what the solutions could be. So the mission is there to create a different kind of space, a space in which the ocean as a whole in all its dimensions is available for transformation and it has to be co-created. This is the beginning of a process, uh, uh, certainly not the end. Now I know Antidia, we were going to give the floor, I think some of your colleagues here, I, I hope you can ask a really difficult question of somebody else. Thank you very much. There are about 100 young Europeans. We have the honor to work on recommendations. And there's one I would like to put to you today. We were speaking about outermost regions or Europe, uh, regions other than Europe in the world. Is there a strategy in place for continued training? And is there a real financing strategy in place to finance that training because jobs are changing across the world. They are changing at the pace of innovation. And we believe, and in, in my humble opinion, that Europe is positioning itself as a leader and putting itself above other states, other continents as well, where continued vocational training is concerned in these subjects. And I will uh, give the floor to my colleague who has another subject to raise. Thank you. A second question has to do with maritime transport. What are you intending to do to speed up the energy transition for vessels? 
and to move to shift to green fuel. Uh, one uh, for surf. One of the things that we were looking at within Surf Rider is ensuring that there's a, a lesser impact on the environment and that there is a renewal of Europe's maritime fleet, which, um, for example, that can take place between now and 2040. The idea would be to progressively take out of commission any vessels that don't meet the environmental assessment criteria. So, Ola, does this type of system seem feasible in your view? Uh, we would be very interesting, interested to hear what you have to say on those recommendations. Thank you. Yeah. Anthony, would like to go? Yes, because they didn't present themselves, so they're part of a <laughs> network, European Youth. So there are those revendications that they work with, and they were quicker than the European Commission and the Parliament could make it. So this is part of the, 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 the gamble they made to, to work together with 25 countries. And I, I will start on the on shipping, of course, but uh, I will let uh, the other one on the outermost regions. Uh, of course, we have, uh, and with Tiago, you were also a leader on this part on shipping to find proposal uh, to accelerate uh, decarbonization. This is part of uh, a leg uh, of the starfish. Uh, we, we try to, to put together and to facilitate, of course, uh, certification, labelizing to identify what kind of performance we could bring in. And maybe on outermost regions. Christina? Est-ce qu'on peut éventuellement pour les outre-mer, les outermost regions, donner la parole? Could we, on this subject, give the floor to Stéphane Bijou? Because I believe that Stéphane would be better placed to respond to this. And then I'll say a few words about maritime trans transport after afterwards. Yes, thank you very much. Good evening to everyone. And thank you very much to Catherine for having mentioned the outermost regions and also talking about the the road that we are in uh, are on for these regions. Uh, we're, uh, we are a Europe of three oceans, and that is fundamental. To answer your question, yes, the question of training is a fundamental one. In Europe, we have a general consolidation of all budgets for training. And what I would like to share with you this evening is that we have consolidated budgets for training, and we've also consolidated and bolstered the budgets for regional cooperation with the interreg program. So my answer to your question is to say that in terms of training, you have to think about collective intelligence. What can we do with the neighbors in, uh, that we have around us in our, in our countries, in our regions more generally? How can we come together to put together training programs, but also how can we share the information that we have? Because regardless of where we are, we are all together and we are all affected first and foremost by climate change, especially when you're an island in uh, the middle of the sea, as in the case of the outermost region. So that's what I wanted to share with you. And um, perhaps you might know that all of the strategies that we've been working on, uh, which is very important for, the, for France, also for Europe, it really needs to involve those outermost regions. So thank you very much. And I do share Pascal Lamy's optimism as well about our ability to take on these shared challenges that lie ahead of us. Catherine and then Christina. Oui, sur le, sur le transport maritime. On maritime, maritime transport, just an, actual, uh, an added response. We're currently working on implementing the Green Deal at the moment, and there are several legal texts going through which uh, require transport to be decarbonized. One is called EU Fuel Maritime. This is about alternative fuels for maritime transport. There's another one that is about bringing maritime transport into the ETS, the Emissions Trading Scheme. And then, this is a, a personal message that I'm really pushing for or, since arriving at the European Parliament, and that is that there, there is an enormous amount of innovation going on within the EU. And I think that with a view to making sure that Europe is held up as an example, we need to make Europe a champion of green shipping, and that requires cooperation within the European Union. We know that in France there are a great many projects that are coming out that involve hybrid forms of transport, also in, um, on, on the seas, but it's quite difficult to get them out. But there is one 
project called Canopy, which is going to be transporting aerial components across the seas. This requires political commitment, but that's where the problem lies. And uh, tomorrow morning, I really hope that we will hear from our leaders that uh, Europe will become a champion of green shipping. Christina. Just, just a comment. Thank you for your uh, question relating education and uh, skills and jobs. Now we are facing this transition, energetic, uh, uh, ICT, in all sectors. These uh, re will require new kind of skills. We do not know now which kind of jobs we will have in a few years. So it's not easy. We must educate people at the university level for jobs that we do not know what will be. That means we must change the kind of education, very multidisciplinary, related with the private world. So this is a point. So look at future skills, blue skills, but not only. Another point, digitalization. This is a key word, digital twin. Everything is becoming digital. But if you look at data relating professional in ICT or professional in big data, in uh, artificial intelligence, the number at European level are very low. For example, with female, this is a very delicate point for Europe. Female, professional females in the ICT sectors are the 17% of all. And so we must really invest on these kind of new skills. If we will have new technologies, then we must have the people that are able to deal with it. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> is somebody trying to join us, Catherine? <laughs> Dresina wanted to add something, I believe. I'm not sure if she's online. Okay, well, um, if I may, because we, we're going to need to wrap up soon. We, we don't want to feel, Laurent, you mentioned the breast people 300 years ago measuring the, the waters. We don't want to feel as if we've been there for the last 300 years. So. Um, I want to hand over to somebody who has, a, again, another inspiring voice uh, from the ocean, uh, Guillaume Neri. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the One Ocean Summit for offering me the chance to be one of the ambassadors of this One Ocean Summit. And I promise you that we're only going to take a few minutes of your time, because I know we're all hungry. And I'd just like to share my view with you. My name is Guillaume Neri. I'm 39 years old, and for 25 years I've been diving into the oceans. I'm a free diver, meaning that I go down to the deepest depths of the ocean with just one inhalation. I've participated in several championships. I've broken some world records sometimes going down to over 120 meters. And this was a quest or a challenge that was first of all physical and sportive, but over the years it's become a way of life, a way of exploring how man adapts to extreme conditions and to also explore some of the wonders of the world underwater in silence, respect and with simplicity. Now I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, I'm not an economist. And for me, the, the grey matter, let's say, of all of my reflections has been all of my, the fruit of my experiences underwater. Every metre explored put me up against two main limits, one both physical and physio physiological within my discipline, holding my breath and dealing with the pressure which increases the deeper you get. Now, I learned that in order to deal with the crushing sensation on your body, body, you have to follow a logic of acceptance, of release and humility when it comes to the power of the elements. I also learned that in order to manage the quantity of oxygen that had been reduced due to my one sole inhalation, I had to save energy. I had to move sparingly and I had to be minimalist and respect sobriety. Now, the, I learned some precious lessons that I brought back onto dry land, and, that go, and these lessons go beyond um, my sport. 
They are linked to my environment and to the elements. And I must, of course, compare all of this to some of the major challenges that we face as a, fe as a species. Now, a summit, this is, of course, um, vital because it allows us to focus all of our attention on the ocean and to speed up reflection and actions. However, I have asked myself some questions regarding the approach that is needed for such a, an essential challenge. Should we not question some of our priorities? There have been many discussions regarding innovations and technology as the panacea. We speak a lot about blue economy, um, viewing the ocean only as a resource to be exploited, one that is, of course, sustainable. But it is a blue economy which only seeks to fuel the perpetual nature of a system based on growth, which, like the ocean, seems to have perhaps been exhausted in terms of what it can give. These solutions bring up what I believe is a crucial um, issue regarding the way we live our lives, regarding our quest to dominate nature and our pursuit of progress and abundance. Now, there's no point classifying threats because we know that they all outdo each other in terms of their gravity. We've spoken about plastic pollution. We know the effect it can have on climate change and on our oceans. But Unfortunately, the destruction of living organisms and the disappearance of biodiversity is often an afterthought. We need to put respect of living organisms back at the heart of our considerations. We need to get out of this vision of seeing the ocean as only something that can be useful to us. We need to protect our oceans and drastically increase the number of marine protected areas so that they are not just empty shells, but there's real regulation around them. And we also need to make sure that the, that certain areas, fallow areas in the ocean, exist in the form of reserves. We need to take into account the chemical pollution on Earth, with this pollution which floods our, our land and then which ends up in our oceans. And very urgently, we need to regulate the practice of industrial fishing, which, just like agriculture on land and intensive livestock breeding on the land, destroy living organisms. So it's not about classifying threats, but we have to be realis realistic. All companies, and this is, or, excuse me, all tasks, and this is a huge task, need priorities with regards to implementing actions. And so we need to make sure that the um, battles that are fought on the front line do not make us lose sight of the battles that are fought um, elsewhere. The scientific community has been warning us for decades, and it's time now for Europe to assume its responsibilities with regards to the largest maritime space in the world. And they can only do this by taking ownership of this challenge and protect our oceans. Thank you. Merci, Guillaume, for the uh, well, thank you very much, Guillaume, for that account. It has a slightly different meaning in most conferences, but you've brought us back to the centre of our challenge, which is to make peace with nature. That's our task, uh, and we have to change the context. Merci bien. Um, I will stop here. I think we have plenty to do, a lot of action, a lot of expectation, a lot of institutional uh, change to take place, a lot of citizens to engage with and member states to convince. Um, and we have our one great ocean uh, to serve. It needs us now. We need to move. We need to act. And tomorrow I expect our leaders at this historic first summit on the ocean because of France. When we look at the blue flag of Europe, we will look at the colour as representing an ocean union, looking up at the stars from a clean and healthy ocean in the future. And now I give the last word to Pascal Confin, who I think is either in video or confined somewhere waiting uh, to speak, but I think he's luckily is, is recorded. A member of the European Parliament, and after that, I wish you a very fine evening. Bonsoir à tous et à toutes. Merci. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be with you in Brest today, but I absolutely wanted to contribute to this event. 
I would like to thank all of the participants of this roundtable, and particularly Catherine Chabot. The Green Deal wouldn't be the Green Deal if there was not a ocean dimension that is very strong. And with Catherine, I have been pushing for that within the European Parliament. What do we already have? What has already been decided? And in the coming weeks, what decisions will be taken to strengthen the um, weight of the ocean in the, within the Green Deal? First of all, the um, support when it comes to treating plastic, the plastic treaty, and new rules in Europe so that we can diminish the use, uh, the, 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 rather the quantity of plastic that ends up in our oceans. Secondly, we are going to pay those who protect our coastlines better, those who protect our wetland areas, our mangroves, our coral areas, so that we can restore um, our oceans and their capacity to stock um, CO2. And so the, with the, um, an increase in the price of CO2, we will be able to better pay those who safeguard our oceans. Thirdly, we are finally going to make sure that the CO2 is paid for by maritime companies who pollute. And we're going to make sure that this is something integrated into the European um, emissions trading system. Today, a ton of CO2 is paid at between 90 and 100 euros. And through an increase in this price, we are going to encourage these actors to change their ways. We're also going to accompany these companies so that they can decarbonize their fleets and also the different types of um, fuels that they use, replacing those fuels with ones that are more environmentally friendly. And I will, can also say that in the Farm to Fork um, initiative at European level, we want to reduce the leakage of fertilizers that end up in our rivers and then on our coastlines, in our seas. And to conclude, an extra point is that of restoring ecosystems and obligations on the part of all um, EU countries. Some countries have already done so, with, such as France, to protect 30% of our um, Mediterranean as uh, marine protected areas, to protect these exceptional areas. Now, I haven't spoken about all of the different elements of the ocean deal, but when we add up what I have spoken about, we see that the ocean is clearly at the heart of Europe's strategy. It's a, f it's a fundamental um, link in the chain. So I'm at the European Parliament as president of the uh, European, uh, excuse me, the Environment Commission. And along with those who have gone before me, I can assure you that we are going to be as ambitious as possible so that we can continue to uh, protect our ecosystems and fight against climate change. You can count on us at the European level. Thank you. The Nautilus is waiting for us. The Nautilus numérique nous attend à l'extérieur. Bonsoir à tout le monde.